Thank you. First, I would like to thank uh, the organizers for having us here at this great conference and also for giving me the opportunity to present our work. I will talk today about tunneling between Landau levels in a large quantum dot, in the integer, and then also in the fractional quantum Hall regime. This is work that has been done in the group of Klaus Enslin and Thomasin at ETH Zurich, and we get our wafer material uh, from the Wegscheider group. Let me start with a quote from Klaus von Klitzing. So in his most recent paper, he stated, the fractional quantum Hall effect and new interaction phenomena will be more important not to mention that a macroscopic picture of the quantum Hall effect for real devices is still missing. So even after more than, uh, even after almost 40 years, there is still a lot of open questions in the field of uh, quantum Hall physics. And uh, I think we've also seen this here uh, at this conference. And uh, there's still a lot of research to do, especially if you want to go into, into the direction of using the fractional quantum Hall effect um, for quantum computing, for example, uh, the five-half state. Let me now show you some of the experiments that have been done on the fractional quantum Hall effect and on fractional quasi-particles. I don't mean to be complete. There is a lot more, um, just some for illustration. So shortly about the experimental measurement of the fractional quantum Hall effect, Laughlin proposed the existence of fractionally charged quasi-particles, and it took more uh, then 10 years to actually measure uh, first experimental evidence for this fractional charge. So this has been done by uh, short noise experiments. Um, there we look at the current through uh, quantum point contact, which is weakly backscattering. And especially we look at the noise uh, in this current uh, versus the backscattered uh, current. Um, and now due to the uh, discrete nature of charges, we can only have an integer number of particles um, that uh, contributes uh, to this current. And that means that we have a statistical uh, distribution in our current, and this is exactly the short noise. And this short noise is proportional to the charge of the charge carriers. And we can see here that in this experiment for the fractional one-third state, they measure the charge that follows the line of one-third uh, of the electronic charge and not uh, the much steeper uh, electronic charge that you can see here. Now we can close the QPC. We can, we can go into the regime of strong backscattering uh, where almost all of the current is reflected. And we see that the short noise measures a charge uh, that follows uh, the electronic charge. So this has also been theoretically predicted. If we are in the strong backscattering regime, we just measure electronic charge. There is no quasi-particle stuff. This has an influence on how we look at uh, quantum dots. In quantum dots, we, has, we have two uh, closed barriers that are in the strong backscattering regime. And that means that we never observe fractional quasi-particles tunneling into our dot or out of our dot. On the other hand, uh, the quantum Hall effect is topological. We have edge states, and we can use two QPCs to form uh, an interferometer, similar to what we do in optics. So you can see that we have the two QPCs, some of the edge channels are completely transmitted, some are completely backscattered, and then there is one edge channel which is weakly backscattered by both of our QPCs. So now we can either go straight through our QPC, or we can be backscattered at our second QPC, going around the interferometer device, thereby picking up an Aronoff bone phase due to the magnetic field that we encircle, and uh, then interfere uh, with the edge channel that just passes through straight. So thereby we will gain uh, some interference pattern. This has been uh, experimentally observed in the integer quantum Hall regime, where you can see a periodic pattern of the transmitter current as a function of magnetic field and uh, of some gate voltage which tunes the area. On the other hand, we look at a finite size device. So we have also discrete charging events and um, they will then self-consistently rearrange those edge channels, slightly change the area, and thereby also give an interference effect. But you can see that the slope of this interference effect uh, is different. I would like to mention two very recent experiments on the fractional quantum Hall regime. The Manfra group realized uh, fractional interferometry on the one-third state and on the two-third state, showing clear aharonov bohm signal. So you see this in the slope of those lines and they measured a fractional charge of one-third and of one in the two-thirds. 
And on the other hand, Bob Willett shows data uh, on the fractional 5 half and 7 half state. So now what about quantum dots? I already told you that we will not observe fractional quasi-particles tunneling in or out of our quantum dot. But can we observe anything else in the quantum Hall regime? We can look at the single particle spectrum. We can look at the energy levels um, as a function of magnetic field. And you see that we have two different slopes appearing um, of uh, two different uh, lines, and they cross with each other. So. And each of those slopes corresponds to a different lambda level. On the other hand, we can look at Coulomb oscillations. So at zero uh, magnetic field, we have a random evolution of the amplitude of our Coulomb oscillations in our quantum, as you can see here in this bottom trace. If we now go to finite magnetic field into the quantum Hall regime, we see that our uh, amplitude is periodically modified. And we see also that the uh, periodicity decreases when we go to higher fields. This is closely related uh, to something called cyclic population. Here we are now at the filling factor two. Our dot has two compressible regions, two compressible rings inside uh, of the quantum dot. And now if we look at transport, we can either tunnel into the outer ring or into the inner ring. So you see a schematic here. Now the amplitude of the Coulomb, uh, of the Coulomb uh, oscillation will be higher if we tunnel through the outer uh, ring than when we tunnel through the inner ring. And you can see this here. Um, tunneling through the outer uh, ring is marked by green dots and tunneling through the inner one by red dots. And now you also see why this is called uh, cyclic depopulation, because if we uh, start to deplete our quantum dot, we see a pattern uh, of weak and strong peaks corresponding to a depopulation um, of uh, cyclic going through the outer or through the inner lambda level. Then interactions and spin uh, were observed to be still very important, and they were actually shown to modify all of the results uh, that I've shown you here. Yes? It's normal Coulomb oscillation, but once you tunnel through the outer ring, which is... Uh, Exactly, yes. Once you turn it through the inner, once through the outer, and they have different amplitudes. Okay, so what is now the idea that we have? We want to observe uh, time resolved tunneling of fractional quasi particles. And um, by this, we want to learn more about fractional states and fractional quasi particles, maybe also about uh, edge reconstructions. How does the edge really look like? Um, we will use a large quantum dot. By this, we gain energy quantization, but the dot is still so large that we actually preserve a quantum Hall state in the middle of our quantum dot. And we will use this quantum dot as a charge detector for charging processes that are happening in the dot itself. By this, we can combine uh, the advantages of transport measurements with charge detection techniques. And I will actually show you that you can measure the tunneling uh, between Landau levels. So first we will look at the integer regime and by this establish this whole process. And then I will also show you some data on the fractional regime. This is closely related to some previous experiments that have been done by Van der Waart et al. And I've already shown you that we have a similar regime, the cyclic depopulation, which is also closely uh, related. Okay, so we will start by looking at the uh, conductance through our quantum dot, how it changes with the gate voltage and uh, with the magnetic field. Once we understand that at a filling factor, we will look at how it changes for different filling factors going from filling factor two towards filling factor one. Then we can actually uh, go to an interferometer like device by opening up our quantum dot barriers. And in the end, I will show you that we actually see modified uh, Coulomb peaks in the fractional quantum hole regime. So let me start uh, with our sample. We have an aluminum gallium arsenide heterostructure hosting a two-dimensional electron gas roughly 100 nanometer below the surface. We pattern it into a whole bar shape. We put contacts such that we can pass a current. 
then of course we have a magnetic field in the perpendicular direction in order to observe Hall effect. Then we put uh, metallic Schottky gates on top, and with this we can deplete our electron gas underneath by applying negative voltages and defy our, define our nanostructures. With all those contacts around it, we can actually measure the transversal and longitudinal resistivity of our sample in the bulk uh, here, and then also across our nanostructure. So let's look at the magnetotransport in the bulk. Here you see the longitudinal and transversal uh, resistivity as a function of the magnetic field. You can clearly see um, that we observe uh, the integer quantum Hall effect. We see a plateau for filling factor two, filling factor one, with the corresponding zeros in the longitudinal resistivity. You also see that we have some uh, fractions present in between. Now let's look at what uh, nanostructure we actually fabricate here in the middle. Uh, this is a, a scanning electron micrograph uh, of the innermost part of our structure. You see that we have five top gates, which are used uh, to define our quantum dot. Um, and we have a side length of our quantum dot of roughly uh, one micrometer. Now we want to look at what uh, quantum Hall states are present uh, in our quantum dot. And by this, we measure uh, the transversal and longitudinal resistivity through our dot with open barriers. So we just measure uh, quantum Hall effect in this constriction, basically. You see that we again have plateaus for filling factor two, filling factor one. They overlap with the bulk measurement. And they are only slightly shifted to the left. That means that our density is slightly reduced, but we still get quantum Hall states in our quantum dot. Now we say that if we uh, define our barriers, we are actually not changing much and we still have the quantum Hall state present. So now we go to the quantum Hall regime uh, between filling factor two and filling factor one. We have two compressible regions in our quantum dot that are marked by these blue regions and also in the uh, leads. And they are separated by an incompressible strap. So now let's form the quantum dot. We apply negative voltages to our gates us, we are depleting the electron gas underneath, and we form an island, which is then our uh, quantum dot. We look at the dependence of the conductance as a function of the two barrier gates, and so those two gates here. We can see that we have peaks uh, in our conductance whenever uh, the energy level of the quantum dot aligns with our electrochemical potential of uh, the contact. You can see that those, uh, we call this a Coulomb resonance, and you can see that those Coulomb resonances are nicely parallel, and they exist over a large uh, regime uh, in uh, this uh, gate voltage range. So we can say that we have a stable quantum dot in the quantum Hall regime. So here we have already a magnetic field applied, and we are at filling factor two. Um, I should maybe mention that experimentally, it's actually not so easy to get nice measurements of quantum dots uh, in the quantum Hall regime because you get a lot of uh, localiza uh, localizations, localized states close to your quantum dot and in your barriers, and they will lead to charge rearrangements that you see in your measurement. You can also see that uh, sometimes the conductance jumps here from trace to trace, but still overall we have a very nice picture and a, and a very stable quantum dot. So now let's fix uh, our uh, barriers. By this, we basically fix the tunneling uh, through our barriers, so the tunnel coupling to the leads. And we look at the conductance as a function of uh, plunger gate voltage, so a gate voltage, and the magnetic field. And we see that we have a very complex uh, pattern which is appearing here. You can look at uh, traces along the plunger gate axis. We see that we have double peaks uh, appearing. And we can also look at uh, traces through the magnetic field where we have groups of peaks that appear. So now we want to understand this in more detail and we will go through this step by step, starting with the dependence on the plunger gate. So we have uh, our plunger gate here. Uh, if we change this plunger gate, we are actually shifting our energy levels in the quantum dot and we will get a peak or current flowing whenever uh, the energy levels are aligned with our electrochemical potential of the contacts, we can shift it and go into the regime where we have no current. So what we would expect is single Coulomb peaks. But what we actually observe is that some of the peaks uh, split up and show a double peak feature. 
Now you could say that this is due to unwanted charge rearrangements, but we can repeat this measurement for many times for over 60 traces, and you actually see uh, that those split peaks, uh, they are preserved. Even if we have a charge rearrangement, as you can see here, for example, or here, uh, afterwards, the effect is again stable and preserved. So we have split Coulomb resonances uh, that appear as a function of our plunger gate. So how can we understand this? So we have two lambda levels present in our quantum dot, giving rise to uh, two compressible regions. And basically, each lambda level will form a quantum dot by itself. So we can unfold this in this schematic picture here. I just fold out the inner lambda level, such that we have here our two dots. This is the inner lambda level uh, and the outer lambda level. They are tunnel coupled to each other, as you can expect from, from a quantum dot. They're also tunnel coupled to the leads, in principle, both of them, but uh, the tunnel coupling through the inner one to the inner one is suppressed, and that's why we don't consider it. So we have only the outer quantum dot, which is tunnel coupled to our leads. Then both of our quantum dots are also capacitively coupled uh, to our plunger gate. That means that we can shift the energy levels within both of them with the plunger gate voltage. So now we look at the current as a function of plunger gate, and we basically see the Coulomb peaks of our outer dot. Now it can happen that an electron is tunneling from the inner lambda level to the outer one. That is, we have rearranged some charge, and due to the capacitive coupling, the peak of the outer uh, quantum dot will shift in plunger gate voltage. In other words, we basically can compensate uh, the shift of charge by changing the voltage that we apply at our gate. So that means we have here our peak that shifts. Now this tunneling can happen back and forth, uh, in our measurement, uh, we have some certain integration time, and if this tunneling is faster than our integration time, we will actually measure uh, an average over those two shifted peaks. So that explains how we can get to uh, such split peaks that we see. Now, actually, we are looking at an activated process, and so that means this averaging process follows a Boltzmann distribution. Yes? Yes. Yeah in, yeah, in principle, it's just capacitive coupling. That shifts, our, that shifts your peak, and uh, yeah. OK, we can fix our plunger gate voltage at a certain value, and we can look at uh, the conductance as a function of magnetic field. We see that we have groups of peaks uh, that are appearing. Over one of such a group, we change the total electron number in our quantum dot by one. We can zoom in on one of those groups, and we see uh, that we have something like a sawtooth pattern appearing with the peaks being asymmetric. One of the slopes is steeper than the other slope. You can look at the simple theoretical model where we now look at the, um, at the energy levels of our ring, so of the outer uh, Landau level. And now if we increase the magnetic field, the Landau level degeneracy increases. And that actually means we have more space in our outer Landau level and we will rearrange electrons from the inner Landau level to the outer one. And every time we do this, uh, this will actually lead to a jump uh, in the electrochemical potential of our ring. Then we have a self-consistent rearrangement, and this leads to this sawtooth shape. So this translates into the current, uh, into uh, this sawtooth pattern of peaks. Each peak corresponds to a rearrangement, and uh, two peaks are spaced by a flux quantum due to this Landau level degeneracy argument. And you see that this nicely matches with the measurement that we have. So now we can go back and look at the full uh, dependence on plunger gate and magnetic field. Uh, we see that we have regions of conductance um, separate, separated by regions where there is no conductance in between. And we are changing the total electron number by one when we cross such a region. 
Each of those uh, fine lines corresponds to a rearrangement of electrons between the two Landau levels in our quantum dot. So we can nicely put this together, and we see that we have Landau level tunneling uh, in our quantum dot over a large uh, regime in our parameter space. Now we can zoom in in part of this map, which looks like this. You can nicely see the rearrangement lines. And now let's for a moment uh, take a step back and go to a standard double quantum dot model. Here we can actually control the number of electrons with two separate gates. We have two separate gates for, for the uh, two quantum dots, and we can change uh, the number of electrons on each dot independently by changing those gate voltages. And this actually leads us to uh, regions where we have a stable charge configuration, and uh, we see that we have uh, a hexagonal uh, pattern. So we call this a charge stability diagram. In principle, we are also looking at a double quantum dot in our case. So this is now in, in the magnetic field, but we, we should be able to do the same thing. So now let's try to do this. Let's just randomly fix this region uh, where, uh, with these numbers, where N1 is the number of electrons on the outer Landau level, and N2 is the number of electrons on the inner Landau level. Now when we cross the, um, one of those lines here, we are actually looking at uh, Coulomb peaks of the outer level. So that means we are changing the electron number of the outer level uh, by one, and thus we can uh, define this as our first transition. No. Yes? <laughs> well, okay, we are looking at the lowest Landau level, at the two spin split branches of the lowest Landau level. Uh, actually, each process is a spin flip process, and um, yeah, this is still an open question. I will actually point it out uh, later, but in principle, we are neglecting spin for the moment, but it's always there. We always flip a spin. Yes, so it's a two spin split branches. It's really new equals two, lowest Landau. Okay, so now if we cross this zigzag line that I already indicated here, we are changing the total number in our quantum dot. And since we already uh, defined what happened here at this, uh, this uh, charge rearrangement line, uh, this means that basically if we cross the dotted line, we are changing the electron number in our inner quantum dot. Um, we cannot see this line in the measurement because uh, we already said that this current is uh, strongly suppressed. We, we don't have uh, tunneling current directly uh, through the inner level. So this leaves us with one more line, and this is actually uh, when we cross uh, those um, drawn out lines, we are rearranging electrons between our two quantum dots. Um, and this is a char an internal dot process, and that actually also means it doesn't contribute to the current. So that's why we also don't see it uh, in the measurement of the conductance. So now we have constructed a charge stability diagram for our case, and I would like to point out the um, differences or the similarities between uh, the standard uh, double dot uh, case and our case here. With the plunger gate, we can change the total electron number in our quantum dot. Um, and that means that corresponds actually uh, to going along this line in our standard double quantum dot picture. On the other hand, we can change the difference between the occupations of the two Landau levels by changing the magnetic field, and that corresponds to going along uh, this direction. So with this, we understand what happens at a given filling factor. We were always close to filling factor two now. Now let's see what happens if we change the filling factor. So this picture uh, we know, we are at filling factor two, now let's go toward towards filling factor one. Roughly at uh, a filling of 1.5, we see that our uh, charge rearrangement lines extend and they combine. And we also see uh, that we have some more noise appearing, the, nice, uh, the lines seem noisier. Then we go on towards filling factor one, at some point we see uh, that we have uh, Coulomb lines appearing that do not have rearrangements as a function uh, of the magnetic field. So how can we understand this evolution? Let's look at the energy dependence of our Landau levels in the quantum dot. So we have our uh, lowest uh, Landau levels, uh, our lowest Landau level with the two spin split branches um, that has some background potential in our quantum dot. 
and then we have the confinement potential with, which bends upwards uh, our um, Landau levels at the edge of our quantum dot. So this actually leads to two compressible rings in our quantum dot where the Landau level bends above the Fermi energy. So this is the picture that we've been looking at so far, um, and we understand what is happening here. Now, when we go towards filling factor one, at some point, the upper Landau level um, it gets close to the Fermi energy. We have a lot of localized puddles and localized states. So we get a lot of localized states inside of our quantum dot that are all coupled to the outer ring. And that actually leads to a smearing out of this charge rearrangement lines because we are coupling to many quantum dots, localized states in some sort, and uh, that's what we see here. And this also explains why we have a much noisier picture. And then at some point, the upper Landau level just goes above. Uh, the Fermi energy is completely empty. We just have one filled Landau level. It bends upwards, gives us a compressible uh, ring in our quantum dot, and we are basically looking at a single simple quantum dot. So we get simple Coulomb oscillations that do not rearrange uh, as a function of magnetic field. So you can look at the full dependence. Um, so here you always see the plunger gate magnetic field map that we have been looking at so far. Here you see the position in magnetic field as we go from filling uh, on, on top of our quantum hole trace as we go from filling factor two towards filling factor one. Let's uh, look at this again. The lines start to combine, then they start to change their slope and go into simple Coulomb oscillations on the filling factor one. So now we understand uh, our evolution. So now we want to go to a different regime. We want to open up our quantum dot, open up the barriers, uh, and look what happens. So far, we've been looking at the quantum dot, the QPCs, have been fully uh, pinched off, so we had a feeling factor very close to zero. Now what we want to do is we want to open them up and uh, selectively pass one of the edge channels. Um, thereby we would uh, assume that we get an interfere meter picture, and I directly show you the transmission as a function of plunger gate and magnetic field uh, at a feeling factor close to two, and you see that we have a periodic pattern uh, appearing. So we can calculate an expected classical transmission, uh, taking into account our two um, uh, transmissions of the two barriers. And what we actually have done is we, we have chosen the color scale in a way that this classical transmission lies in the middle. So now we see that we have constructive and destructive interfer interference around this uh, classical uh, expected transmission. We can see that we have uh, two different slopes appearing. So one slope is when we follow these uh, red lines um, uh, here. This has a positive uh, slope. We can put other lines following the maximum of the red line uh, like this. And this has a negative slope. So now what do we expect for an interferometer? We have uh, two effects. First, we have the Aronoff-Bohm effect where we uh, just pick up a Aronoff bohm phase in our interferometer uh, due to the flux that, that is present in our device. And this will lead uh, to a theoretically, uh, to a period of one uh, flux quantum. And this shows uh, lines of uh, constant phase with a negative slope. On the other hand, we are looking at a, a finite size device. It's a very small device, so we have discrete charging events. Uh, they self-consistently rearrange uh, the edge channels and change the area slightly. And by this, we also get an interference effect, but what you now observe actually is that the slope of the lines with constant phase uh, is positive. Um, of course, we can have both effects present, and uh, in this mixed case, this picture looks like this. So now we can actually identify our blue dotted line with the Coulomb case and our a green dashed line with the aronoff bohm case. So we have a aronoff bohm interference in our device uh, mixed with Coulomb uh, effects. We can do the same as we did for the dot. Look at the interferometry as it changes from filling factor two to filling factor one. Um, for 
being close to failing factor two, we have our interferometer being coupled basically to an inner quantum dot. So it's uh, dominated by the charging of this quantum dot and you see uh, a strong dominance of the Coulomb features and only a very weak uh, contribution of the Harnoff bohm effect. Then we go close to failing factor 1.5 where we have an island with a lot of localized states that is coupled to our interferometer. Um, we see that this actually washes out the Coulomb uh, charging a little bit. We have some of the Coulomb charging uh, still being uh, present, but we see that the Aronoff bohm effect gained in presence. And then going to filling factor one, we lose our uh, localized states in the middle. We just have one interfering edge channel, and you see that we have uh, only the Aronoff bohm effect uh, remain. So we have the charging of the inner quantum dot of the inner Landau level that actually strongly influences our interferometer picture. So we can compare this uh, to the quantum dot. Here, the upper line corresponds to the interferometer that I've just shown you. Here, uh, uh, it corresponds to the quantum dot case that I've shown you before. You can see that here we are strongly Coulomb dominated uh, of the charging of the inner Landau level. Then we go on, we, uh, we wash out this charging because we are suddenly coupled to many localized states uh, in the middle of our quantum dot. And then at some point we lose uh, the inner Landau level and we recover a simple interferometer device in this case and uh, with a Harnoff bohm interference and a simple quantum dot with simple Coulomb resonances in that case. So now some remarks uh, on the integer Landau level tunneling. Um, we can actually do this in a time resolved uh, way. We can measure the tunneling between Landau levels time resolvedly. Uh, we can fix our plunger gate voltage on one of those split peaks and look at the current as a function of uh, time. And we will see this telegraph signal uh, that switches between, uh, between two different levels of current, where one level now corresponds to the dot being on the, uh, the electron being on the inner Landau level or the other one on the outer Landau level. From this, we can do counting statistics, um, uh, full counting statistics, um, similar to what has been done on single dots and double quantum dots, and so on. Now, we would act actually uh, like to place an additional charge detector, so a QPC close to our quantum dot, and uh, look at the current uh, through this QPC. And from this, we would like to see um, different charging lines in our charge stability diagrams. So this is similar to what uh, is, has been done with double quantum dots if you want to look at charge states of double quantum dots or other multiple dots. And then, um, as uh, your question already pointed out, um, we are not so sure about the influence of spin. Um, so we are looking at the lowest Landau level. We have the two spin split branches and in principle each rearrangement event between uh, our two um, compressible regions flips the spin and we're not so sure what this actually means for our experiment. Now, uh, with this, I would like to, to close the integer quantum hall effect, and uh, let's go into the fractional quantum hall regime. So for this, uh, we need uh, a new sample. Um, the quantum dot structure, the gate structure that we put on top is actually the same as in the integer case that I've just shown you, but uh, now we are reducing the density, so we are looking at a different uh, uh, heterostructure wafer. Uh, let's directly uh, look at uh, the magnetotransport in the bulk of uh, this measurement. So we have the, uh, the transversal and the longitudinal resistance as a function of magnetic field. Um, we again see plateaus for the integers uh, appearing. And then you see uh, a lot of fractional states appearing uh, in between filling factor two and filling factor one, and then also uh, clearly below filling factor one. So we have a lot of fractional states that are present in our bulk uh, and that are actually reachable uh, with uh, our magnetic field that we have in the lab. So now let's look at what states actually are preserved in our quantum dot, what states are still present in our quantum dot. So we, get, we again open up the barriers and we measure uh, the longitudinal and transversal resistivity uh, through our quantum dot. You can see that we have, again, overlapping uh, integer plateaus. And then, also in addition, we have the two-third states, which is actually also in, uh, expressed in our quantum dot. It forms a plateau, and that plateau actually 
uh, overlaps with our bulk. So again, our density is only slightly reduced and uh, we have a fractional two-thirds state present in our quantum dot. So let's go uh, at the higher field end, at the lower filling factor end of this uh, two-third plateau and look at the conductance as a function of plunger gate voltage and magnetic field. We can observe our Coulomb peaks as a function of the plunger gate, and we see that there is some modulation as, a, as we go uh, along the magnetic field. You can see that we have uh, lines with a negative slope that are appearing very similar to what we've seen in the integer quantum Hall effect. We can look at cuts uh, in the plunger gate direction. We only see single peaks appearing. There is no double peaks appearing in this case. And we can look at the magnetic field dependence and we can see our sawtooth pattern uh, as we've seen it in the integer regime. So what we can say from this is that we have a first uh, observation of a non-trivial quantum Hall state uh, that is present uh, in our quantum dot. And it's actually directly visible uh, in the current through our quantum dot. So it modifies uh, our Coulomb peaks that we measure through our quantum dot. Yes. 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 As you've seen uh, in the trace here, uh, we have uh, nothing actually that uh, happens here. We are not quantized, so probably we don't have another quantum Hall state there. Um, probably there is something similar happening as for filling factor two, where you can also go from filling factor two until uh, filling factor 1.5. You still have this uh, uh, interaction effects that stem from uh, the filling factor two. Yes, and we assume that we are very close uh, in our quantum. But you see that there is some shift from this measurement. Yes, so you refer to that we don't see split peaks appearing. Um, so I think that actually the states are probably hybridizing so much um, that, you, that you don't get like lines that run parallel to each other, but they bend into each other and uh, actually combine to one Coulomb peak already. So probably the coupling is so large um, that you only see um, the washed out line and this would not show split peaks. So uh, for example, we can see this effect up to 60 millikelvin. Uh, in the integer case, of course, we have, we have uh, way larger energy gaps and we can go up to uh, 400 millikelvin and still observe it. So that's maybe one indication that it's more fragile and more prone to, uh, to this hybridization. So I already told you that it's very complicated experimentally to measure a dot in the quantum Hall regime, in the integer quantum Hall regime. Um, it's even worse in the fractional regime. You have a lot of charge rearrangements. Um, you can see uh, some of those here. We, we never get this clean data as we've seen it for the integer quantum Hall effect. Nevertheless, we can observe it over a large range in our parameter space. So um, this is really a consistent effect uh, that we see. I've already said that it persists up to 60 millikelvin. You can also go up to uh, 30 uh, micro uh, volt in, in bias. So now there is the big question, do we see fractional quasi-particle? Do we see fractional charge? So if we believe now that one of those lines corresponds to a rearrangement of a fractional charge, we would actually say that the difference between uh, two lines in magnetic field corresponds to a fractional flux quantum. Um, from this, we could calculate the uh, charge of the fractional quasi-particle. Uh, if we know uh, our magnetic field spacing and the area, we measure a magnetic field spacing of 12 millitesla, and we assume that we have an area of roughly 0.36 uh, micrometers squared, which already takes into account some uh, lateral depletion away from our gates. So we are, of course, smaller than our gates because uh, the electric potential washes out that we apply through our gates. If we plug this in, we get a number close to one. So we don't observe any fractional charge uh, so far. This could be consistent with a, a McDonald uh, edge state picture where you have um, an edge state, uh, a new, uh, an integer edge state uh, with a co uh, counter propagating one third state. On the other hand, there is also recent results um, by the Manfra group where they show this interferometry in the two-thirds, uh, actually with a similar size device, 
and they observe also a charge of one for the quasi particles in this case. So, so they have weak barriers. They do interferometry. This one is with strong barriers. We are measuring rearrangements in our quantum dot. So far, we uh, have the magnetic field period which suggests that we have uh, an electron charge. And with this, I would actually uh, like to conclude. Uh, we've seen that we observe uh, tunneling between lambda levels uh, in our quantum dot in the integer uh, quantum Hall regime. We uh, have looked at the evolution between different regimes. Um, we also went uh, and into an interferometer-like device by opening up our quantum dot barriers, uh, seeing that this picture consistently holds also in this case. And then I've shown you the first observations of modulated uh, Coulomb blockade in the fractional quantum hole regime. Um, and from there on, we of course want to uh, go deeper into this fractional effect, understand more, um, see uh, uh, if we can see different uh, things in different samples, maybe with a charge detector, and uh, maybe we can go into the direction of time-resolved tunneling of fractional quasi-particles. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>